I went up there. They asked me to do it. I did it. Have a nice day. I mean, you know, that's the way it is, man. Hey, if you didn't bring a Bible this morning, please raise your hand and we will lend you a Bible. And turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. As you're turning there, just um, by way of uh, testimony, as I am a, and I'm not proud of it, but I'm a teenage father of an aborted child. In 1976, my girlfriend got married, uh, got, got pregnant, and it was available. We didn't know what we were to do. And so, you know, we all fall. You know, it was before, really, I had a close relationship with Christ. And so, uh, so we do. We, we do care, and we do pray, and we do support our our local ministries here in Fredericksburg who help women and couples and, and teenagers and guys too, you know, we, you know, um, with that issue. So uh, just be praying, you know, be praying. You know, they had their march, I guess, yesterday, and that's fine. We're Americans. We can do those things. But uh, be praying for, for this week and all the activities going on, and, and I'm sure we, we bless God through it. Amen. Uh, this morning we're reading and looking at Ephesians chapter 4, where we pick it up in verse 25. Let's back up to verse 17. Uh, let's back up to, yeah, verse 17, and we'll read through to the end of this, but we're focusing on verses 25 and 32 in a message I've entitled, Putting Away. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And here's our verse. Therefore putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Going back to that unity as you began this whole chapter. And uh, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ, what? Forgave you. Father, we thank you, God, for this Sunday morning. We thank you for gathering us here again, God. Lord, some of us, we don't look too good, God. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough weekend. Uh, But we're here. And and we ask that you would speak to us. We we ask in this practical chapter of Ephesians, God, that you feed us and give to us, God, and convict us. That Holy Spirit, have your way with us. For we've come to hear from you. And it's true, God. We don't want to leave here the way we came. We want to focus on you, Jesus, and your love and grace for us. So speak to us, we ask in Jesus' precious name. And the church said, amen. Amen. Last week, Paul instructed us, as we just read, to put off the old and and put on the new man, the new woman. This morning, he's telling us to put away now. (laughs) to put away our our former practices because they become evident, don't they? Friends, let me remind you that Paul is speaking to believers. He's not speaking to non-believers. 
But if there are non-believers here today, if you've yet to give your life to Christ, when we tell you that coming to Christ, and I mentioned this last week, is to repent and receive Christ, repentance doesn't mean you go and, and, and get your life squared away and get your life right before Christ will receive you. No, repentance is just simply agreeing to God that you can't do that, that you are a sinner, and that you're in need of a, salva- a savior and of salvation. No, he's speaking of believers now who have come to Christ and are realizing that there are some things that need to change, that we are no longer to think the same in a sense, no longer to act the same. And so he's telling us to put away our former practices. And, and, and this is not only good for us, right, but good for others. This is not only good for us, it is great for us in our walk, in our life. But oh, how it will bless others. And he says to put away our former practices. And this we can do, friends, and, and, but we do need the help of who? Of the Holy Spirit of God, right? Of the Holy Spirit. Um, this new person is not only a positionally a, a reality of who we are in Christ. We are new. But he continues to speak more on our conduct and our behavior. And uh, that sanctifying process we mentioned. Remember we mentioned that last week? That sanctifying process that we mentioned last week. And it is an ongoing process. And you'll find this out. After over 30 years walking with the Lord. Once you, you figure it out, i gotta, I got to deal with my language. I have, a, I have a potty mouth. Okay, God help me. And, and once that, hey, man, I, I'm, by the Spirit's help, I'm, I've got that control. And all of a sudden, there's a lust issue. Okay, God, well, i got to deal with that. i got to deal with this lust, lust issue. And then, and then when you kind of have a handle on that, uh, going through the Holy Spirit, then all of a sudden, i got an anger issue. But see, these were always there. We just never realized it. And then, friends, you're just going to realize that it's just a common, as I said last week, a battle. And that we got to learn just to yield to the Holy Spirit. we got to learn to tame our tongue. We've got to learn to tame our mind and our, uh, to tame ourselves. Uh, and we can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I, I see this really, uh, these verses, and really uh, most of this chapter is Paul's uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Paul's uh, um, Beatitudes. It's the attitude, isn't it? It's the beatitude, if I could say it that way, as Christ taught us in Matthew and also, I believe, it's in Luke. It's the attitudes of the heart. And as they come up and as we're convicted by them, we need to, to, to put them away. We need to change our attitude. We need to, to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to change our behavior. Or as A.W. Tozer states, the beatitudes are the very qualities which distinguish human life and conduct. And, and that is something that we should embrace. Our part in this is to recognize, as I said, a patterned attitude that is not good nor glorifies God. And then, and then willing to put it away. Put it away. The word there in the Greek, put away, it means to cast off, to lay aside. To cast off, Paul says in Romans 13, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, and it is, friends. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. There it is, cast off, and let us put on the armor of light. Uh, to lay aside, Hebrews tells us, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us, those who have laid their life down, those who have lived out the Christian life, let us lay aside every what? Weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us walk circumspectly. Let us, let us know where we can go and where we can't go. As I said last time, who we can hang with and who we can't hang with. And let us run with the endurance, the race that is set before us. So to cast off, to lay aside is what that means. What are we to put away? Well, we'll find out it's first lying. Unrighteous anger, stealing, corrupt words, bitterness, wrath, clamor, evil speaking. Because why? Because these things grieve the Holy Spirit. It grieves him. And we shouldn't want to do that. We should not want to grieve God. We should want to live for God, you know, to the best of our ability. He knows our heart. And when we do fail and we stumble, he knows our heart. 
that we get up and we continue on in our, in our walk and in our race, as, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. It's there in 1 Corinthians 13 that really Paul gives a, a real clear uh, understanding of this. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, right? But when I became a man, and that is a true man, not a man who still wants to be a teenager. We're not talking a Peter Pan man who still wants to hang out with, with teenagers. And, and No, a man, a man, a reference to maturity. And again, we could even say a, a, a reference to maturity in Christ as we grow. That I put away what? Childish things. And again, some of these things we may not yet know that they're childish, but as we grow, we'll say, yeah, I got to put that away. Yeah, I got to put that away, you know. These are things Paul is speaking to us. These are things that Paul is speaking to believers in our text this morning. And listen, you cannot change your actions until you have been changed. And I'm talking about in Christ. Again, you can do everything you can of the world to try to do it better And you can be a great citizen and a moral person, according to the world's view. But none of that will get you into heaven. No work, no good works, it says, the Bible says. Because no good work will equal the work that was done on Calvary, amen? No good work can compare to that. He has no rival. He has no equal. He has no second. It's Jesus Christ, all that he's done for us. We're exchanging the grave clothes of the old man and putting on the saved clothes. <laughs> Becoming a new man, a new, a new woman, and operating operate now with the mind of who? With the mind of Christ. You say, Mark, how can I get that mind? Be in the word. Get your face in the book. Get into the word of God. I read, I read and I, some things I don't understand. It's okay. Just keep reading. There are helps, there are commentaries, there are, there are people around you that can kind of give you insight. But really, you need to get into the Word of God. And then you become, and you have this mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit, He's our helper, He'll help you in that as well. It is, it is in that Holy Spirit, it is with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us acts like an umpire. You ever hear of that before? He's like the umpire in our heart. He's like that umpire behind home plate. And what a mess it is in baseball right now, huh? But he is like that umpire. And I wish some of these guys listened to the true umpire because they wouldn't be in the pickle that they're in now. But it's like an umpire who calls the strikes and balls. How's that? Well, he pricks our heart and he brings conviction to, to change us. He says, that, Mark, you got to put away. Stop messing with that. Stop dealing with it. Why are you still carrying that? Put it away. Put it away. It's grieving me, man. You, you know, it, it's, it's keeping you from moving forward, whatever the case may be. He pricks our heart. He brings conviction to change us into the image of Jesus daily, into the image of our Lord. So let, let's look at it, study. Verse 25, therefore, everything that he said prior to this, all the things that he's put, he's talked about this new man. He's talked here about, again, uh, uh, Putting off and putting on, he says, put away lying. Let me just say this. A white lie is a what? Thank you very much. And those who don't think so, you're colored blind. It's a lie, man. But yet, why do we have these little, well, it's just a little white lie. I I remember a brother who was trying to give a a surprise party for his wife. And he, he was going, that whole week, he was, he was, he was just going through it because he was trying to not lie and he was trying to kind of bring things around and he goes, boy, I'm so glad it's over, man. He was just, he was convicting, you know. And not that he lied, but he did. But anyway, uh, and I won't mention his name, but he is in this building. <laughs> Lying is the opposite of fact, right? I'm not telling you anything new here. The word is, uh, pseudos in the Greek it means uh, it's, and it's connected to our word pseudo and pseudo means bogus uh, phony it's defined in the Greek as a conscience and intentional falsehood man when you're lying you know you're lying 
No one's going to make you lie. You're lying. You get your hand caught in the cookie jar. Your hand's caught in the cookie jar. Don't try to say, you know, this or that. We are told in the scriptures that the author of lying is who? Satan. The author of lying is Satan. It's there back in the beginning in Genesis, the book of beginnings, and it shows us this with his conversation with Eve. So the first time that we see lying and the first time that God's word and God himself is, is being brought up and, and, and is being challenged is there in Genesis. And he is the author of lying. Acts 5, though, speaks of the first time sin uh, of lying enters the church. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Let's go back in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 5. Some of you know where I'm going with this. I'm just going to read it to you because I wanna, want you to see how, how a lie, how a thought can have legs if it's not caught. If, if a thought is not caught and you know that the thought is not right and you know you're going to lie, you know you're going to go there, if that thought is not caught and given over to the Lord, it's going to have legs. And I want you to see what a lie does in conspiracy with a husband and a wife and in, in the purity of this church. Remember, the church has just been born. It's just been birthed. In Acts chapter 5, it says, A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds. And he can do that. It's his money. And his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has who? Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. The sense is here is that as people were bringing their goods, as people were tithing, if you would, and bringing offerings, they came in here with a conspiracy of keeping some back and acting as if they gave with the same heart and the same amount and the same thing that other people were bringing. And, and, they, and the Holy, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. And they thought that they could lie to God. And you can't. And so he said, why has Satan filled your heart and kept part of the price of the land for yourself? Why, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to who? But to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Now, what if that was still happening today? You know, what if that, you know, ah, where would we all be, right? Well, this is the purity of the church. I believe the Holy Spirit is teaching us how pure the church was there. And where are we at today, church? Where are we at today? But let's keep reading. Then uh, he... he you know, he, he just, bing, he's, he's out. And, uh, and, and the, the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and, and buried him. What a way to go. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And you know me, I'm always thinking this. I think the ushers are back there. So, don't, 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 don't tell you anything. Just get out, get out, get out. And, uh, and Peter said to her, hey, tell me. Whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, oh, yes, for so much. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed to, together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. We told you not to. And they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, burying her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And the reason why I go there, this, it's, you, know, you can get the CD on it if you want, but study it yourself. But see what a lie does? A thought that's not caught? A thought that's not given over? We all have thoughts. Not all those thoughts are good thoughts. Not just given over to the Lord. They wanted to be like everyone else and have everybody, oh, man, you sold some land. What? Oh, man, everybody's giving their possessions. Remember Acts? Everybody's bringing, there's, everybody's bringing, it's a commune type thing, a good commune. 
You know, everybody's just partaking of, of everybody's resources and they're just enjoying it. But here's a lie. Here's a lie that had feet. Here's a lie that, that really, uh, you know, God has brought to our attention and it's not good. He says, put away lying. And lying aside, set aside, put away, we need to pick up truth. We need to pick up truth. He says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Why wouldn't we want to speak truth? Now, some of you take that way to the extreme. And you take truth, and, and it's not in love. And you're like, oh, I'm going to speak some truth now. Let's get some truth going. You know, that's not what he's saying. It's truth and love. And when that's active in the church, guys, when that's active among us and our families, it brings unity, right? It brings unity and trust, and it shows integrity, and it shows holiness in our walk. And this is what Paul wants to get across to this church, and I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning. For us also, to put away lying. Put it away, you know. Moving on, he says, also put away anger. Notice he says, be angry. All right, I can be angry? Yeah, but don't sin. Be angry. and do. There's a place for anger. And, and I hope you get angry. I hope you get angry over the influence of evil in our society. Uh, I hope you get angry over the immoral legislation that's being passed in our state and in our nation. I hope you get angry over criminal activity. I hope you get angry over over. The, the, the drug infestation in our own city. I hope that angers you, angers you to your knees, angers you to pray for our city, for our nation, for our state. I hope you get angry over the sin and harm against our children when you read about it. Man, when I, when I drive around and I see bus stops and kids of all ages, elementary, especially junior high and, and high school, I just pray for them. I don't know what kind of households they live in. I don't know what's being exposed to them. Uh, You know, you know. I don't know what school districts are. I pray for the teachers. It just takes a second to pray, real quick. God bless them. Who knows what they're going through? We all know what they're going through because we were all once junior hires, weren't we? Or middle school, you guys call it here. We should be angry over those things. However, our anger should never lead to sin. We should be angry over the abortion clinics, but it doesn't mean we go and blow them up. And that's what I think uh, the pastor was speaking on, how it kind of turned him off to get involved with this. But, but we find out that's, that's not true. Anger, righteous anger. Righteous anger must be displayed and reacted in a godly manner. When we are dealing with each other, one-on-one or in a marital relationship or as believers in the church, we, we are not to let the sun go down on our wrath. How many have done that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> because we all are guilty of that. We've not dealt with it. We have allowed it. The word picture there is, is a pot on, on a stove, you know, uh, at, at a low heat. But eventually, if it left there, it's going to what? It's going to boil over. Nor give place, he says, to the devil. And that's what happens when we don't have a a cause of being righteously anger. And yet our anger is in a place that begins to be sin. Friends, listen, and we don't deal with it. We keep short accounts with one another. Then it gives place to the devil. Jesus said that anger, and again in the Sermon on the Mount, is the first step toward, first step toward what? Starts with an M, murder. It's the first step toward murder. And Jesus says, if you hate someone, you've murdered someone. He brought it down to it, didn't he? But it's, it's, it's true. It's the first step. We need to diffuse our unrighteous anger quickly. Keep short accounts with one another. Practice, if there is an offense, practice Matthew 18, 15, the biblical instructions 
for resolving conflict. Those are the things that we need to practice. It's not easy, okay? This thing, man, hold on. You can give me a problem. That's the enemy. I bind you. Anyway, it's not easy to, do, to resolve conflict, is it? Do we like to be angry? I like to say things, and I want to get back. That's not the heart, man. Paul says, you got to put that away. You're going to give place to the devil. And like a thief, he comes to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. To destroy relationships, to destroy marriages, friendships. Know that, guys. Satan's ultimate purpose for our lives is destruction. It gives place to the devil. I'm, again, I go back to Genesis. I go back to Genesis. I go, and I'm thinking of what Jesus said, that, that anger is the first step toward murder. I'm reminded of Cain in Genesis when Cain was allowing his anger to boil over, really, he, his jealousy. And jealousy is a big problem, friends. Jealousy is dynamite with legs. You need to be careful. He needed to be careful. He was jealous of his brother because God accepted his brother's sacrifice and didn't accept his. And we can go into that whole argument, but the bottom line, it was his heart. It wasn't, I don't think it was the fact of what he brought God, it's how he brought it. He brought it with a full of jealousy. And it's there, and, and God told Cain in Genesis 4, why are you angry? He's, que- he's got a relationship, he's talking to God. God's talking to him. Why are you angry? And maybe that's something for someone here this morning. Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Where is your joy? He says, if you do well, and that's the problem. If you do well, he wasn't doing well. He wasn't walking with God right. He wasn't doing well. He says, will you not be accepted? He gave him, he asked him why, and then he gives him the, the, the remedy. Do well. Do well. And looking at it this way, because we know the context, he says, get rid of your jealousy. Get rid of your anger. It's growing. It's boiling over. He says, and if you do not do well, listen, sin lies where? At the door. You're going to give an occasion for the enemy. You're going to give place for the enemy to rule over you. He said, if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. And it's desire, that word there means to run over, to lead. Look it up. It's for you, but you should rule over it. Did he heed the word of God? Did he heed the counsel? Did he, did he heed the warning? Well, we know the story. He didn't. He opened that door wide open. Here comes the enemy. Here comes jealousy fulfilling itself. Cain allowed his anger and jealousy to rule his actions, and he killed his brother. That's the first murder in the Bible. The first time a man's blood was spilt in the Bible. The first murder. The first time the word anger is used. Guys, put away your unrighteous anger. Put away your jealousies. Brothers and sisters, let's not be jealous about one another. Don't allow your jealousy to rule you. It'll open an ugly door and ruin relationships. Moving on, he says, put away stealing. Interesting, that word says, let him who stole steal no longer. The word stole is in the Greek, it's klepto. Guess what word do we get from that? (laughs) Yeah, kleptomaniac, dude. Really? This ain't the three stooges. That ain't something to be proud of. Yeah, klepto. But that's the past, isn't it? And we are to put away that activity. If you stole in the past, Christian, don't steal today. Don't don't, don't fall to that. You are a new man, a new woman in Christ. I read in the papers how people embezzle Local companies here, you've read them too, and it's like, I think, do you really think you're going to get away with that? But see, that's what happens. They're blind. They're darkened. They're lust of money. And what really did they do with it? You know, 
What did they do with it? It reminds me of Achan who, 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 who stole or who took what God said not to take. And, and here he is with all this, um, this, this treasure. And what are they doing? They're hiding it. Couldn't even enjoy it. And it ended up taking out him and his wife and his whole family. Blows me away. But here's, here's what you are to do. But rather let him labor. That's the alternative to stealing. Labor, work, yeah. It's uh, working with his or her, uh, uh, for, for his or her livelihood, if you can, if you're able to. Um, you know, we're coming up on tax season. Oh, you had to mention that tax season, didn't you? <laughs> Don't fudge the numbers. Maybe you fudged them before. Don't 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 fudge the numbers. Be true. God will bless you through it. Second Thessalonians three says, if any one will not work, and again, and is able to work, because there are some people who are not able to work. Neither shall he eat. He says, let him who stole. Still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. You're not to be a moonshiner, a hit man. Well, I'm working, man. I got me a job. I'm a dope dealer. Well, friend, you need to be a hope dealer, amen? Giving people hope, not dope. But that's not good. That's not a good career to get into. That's, that, that's not what is good. What is good? What is honoring God? Good for your family. Good for the society. Good for our city. Good for our county. The purpose is, and here it is, that he may have something to give him who has a need. See? Giving is the opposite of stealing. Now that we have put away stealing as the new man, the new woman, we are to give those who are in need. And Jesus says, you, the, those who are in need will always be among you. The poor will always be among us. Or those who are in need will always be among us. And who knows? Listen, maybe if we're helping someone in need and truly in need, we're keeping them from committing a crime. We're keeping them from stealing. We're keeping them from committing a crime out of their hunger or out of their need. I just put that up there. I don't know. We get people to come in here and they have needs and they come to the church and and. You know, we've been doing this. I've been doing this for uh, 16 so years, and I've kind of have a, 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 you know, a sense of it. You know, of course, we pray, and we ask God. You know, we pray over their, their requests, and we have a process that we go through. We, we vet things and, and call and, and uh, try to direct them and job placement, and we try to do all that. But, uh, and, then we, and then if we feel like we want to pay that electric bill and, we want to help them, of course, with food. No one's going to go hungry. We, we, we will not, if you're hungry, we're going to feed you. We're going to, somehow we're going to give you some food. But there are other issues. And we've we all been there. And, and these people don't have uh, any means of resources, and maybe we'll help them. We don't give them money directly. We'll go and pay that electric bill, or we'll pay this or pay that through, a, through the, the, the agency, of course. And maybe give them a Walmart card and have them go and get some food and if we see the kids need clothes, of course, we'll, you know, the office, they love to go shopping, man. Target. And we love doing that. I love doing that, man. But we know that it's a hand up, not a hand out. Hashtag that, please. And that's what our heart is. And, you know, I'm sure we gave and we were ripped off, but that's up between them and my heart. Is, is to give. If they ripped us off, that's up to them and God, you know. So put away stealing. Don't steal no more. How many in the military? War in the military. How many of those black pins we used to take? From? It's the U.S. government. I know. Get rid of them quickly. I don't even know if they still have them. But man, we always had those black pins. So anyway, moving on. Now the conviction is there. Hey, it's been years now. We're all out of. No NJP for us. Put away corrupt communication. Oh, oh, here we go. I was telling the guys, uh, we had some fruit at the men's breakfast yesterday, and, and it wasn't rotten. It was good fruit. We didn't have any gravy, but other than that, 
Uh, that's a side note. You don't need to know about that. That's between me and my brother. But that word corrupt means just that. Just think now. Rotten fruit. I love you. You know I love you guys. I love you. Just, it's all right. It means rotten fruit. How many of you have ever been around rotten vegetables where it just stank? You know? That's what that word means. It means a poor quality. He says, let no corrupt what word proceed out of your mouth. Someone said this way. It's off-colored jokes, profanity, uh, dirty jokes, vulgarity, double and tender. Hey, hello. It should never cross our lips. But that's the way we used to live, right? The guy that run into the, to the squadron, run into the shop, wanted to give, the, heard a dirty joke. Want, you want to be the first guy to say it. Get the laughs. And then you get saved. <laughs> and you think, oh, wow, man. It also includes abusive speech, gossip, using the tongue as a sword to, to hurt people and ruin reputations. He says, no, don't let any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You know, King David wrote in Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Boy, that's a good word, isn't it? Because again, going back to anger, going back to, and we'll get, we'll get that word here flying off the handle. Boy, some things can come out of our mouth. Huh? And maybe it's not vulgarity, but boy, they are pain. They are killing. They, it is sharp. It is cutting. God put a guard over my house, my mouth. <laughs> Jesus said, a good man in Luke 6, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his what? His mouth speaks. His mouth speaks. So I've learned this. And I've stolen this, and so has every other pastor. But you need to think before you speak. Think. The word think, you guys heard this? T is for true. Is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? Let me say that again. Think. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? If it isn't, then keep quiet. (laughs) Take it to God. Take it to the Lord, man. Put a guard over your mouth. Watch your tongue. It's that instrument that is used, if not controlled by the Holy Spirit, to bring harm and damage to another. In this, Paul then says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, he says. The word grieve there is lupeo. It means to offend, to make sorrowful. Which speaks of another interesting insight is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity with personal attributes. And yes, friends, you can offend him as you would offend one another. He is a person. Grieving can lead to quenching then. And quenching is that which puts out, of a, puts out a flame. When we begin to ignore the Holy Spirit's help, we begin to extinguish his leading We begin to suppress his power available to us. And that can lead to drifting, backsliding, and it leads us back to the old person that we were once. And he's buried. She's buried. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit has sealed us. The Holy Spirit, we should be thanking him. We we, we should, for it was he who made it possible for us to be saved. How's that? He pointed us to Christ. He led us to the cross. He convicted us of our sin. And then in that response, in positive response, he sealed us. He marked us as God's precious cargo, God's precious children. He sealed us. He's given to us the the reality and the truth that we are his. 
and we're on our way to heaven. Why would we want to grieve him? But let's be honest, we all do. And Paul says, don't do that. But what grieves the Holy Spirit? Paul gives a list of, of controllable emotions that grieve the Holy Spirit and that we can choose to put away. He says in verse 31, let all, not some, but all. All is Greek, and the Greek is all. Bitterness. Now, I want to talk about this. The word bitterness really means a bitter root. And maybe some of you need to do some gardening. And even maybe some of us need to do some cultivate, some true, true digging deeper. It's a bitter root that produces a bitter fruit. But it needs to be put away. It needs to be cut away. Bitterness, guys, is really an unsurrendered heart. The resentful spirit that refuses reconciliation, someone said. We like being bitter. We stay bitter. We're bitter because of this. We're bitter because of that. And it's never really been dealt with. You've never dealt with it, this bitterness. And... uh, um, And you need to deal with it. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to heal us from the past hurts. Listen, I know it's difficult. I've been pained. I've been hurt in the past myself. But as I allow the enemy to pay rent in my mind, or I allow that person, those words to continue to just pay rent in my heart, in my mind, I'm no good. I'm no good because I start looking at all people that way. I had a friend, uh, he left the Corps and he went into uh, to be a police officer, <laughs> Los Angeles police. Good guy, great guy. Got through the academy, didn't want any easy place. He wanted to most place where he can get more action per se. And I saw him a couple of years later and he wasn't the same man. He hated people. He hated pe- and certain type of people. He hated him. I mean, I just, dude, what's wrong with you, man? But see, he just seen so much. And he started hating people. And this is what bitterness does. It goes even deeper than that. But what we do, guys, if we don't deal with it, listen, please, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to heal us from past hurts, we will bleed on people that didn't cut us. That happens. We start bleeding all over people. He, I didn't cut you. Why are you ble-? That what happened to my buddy. He says here, let all bitterness and wrath, that's Greek for thumos, just you can guess what we get from that word, thumos, that explosive type of anger. And then anger itself, that's a lingering unsettled anger in the mind. Clamor is a manifestation of that unsettled anger. It's, it's, it brings commotion. It brings an outcry, uh, knee-jerk, uncontrolled, can't trust, walking on eggshells kind of relationship because you don't know when that person is just going to go off because he hasn't dealt with it. Evil speaking, that's blasphemy. Using Jesus as a curse word or an explanation What's the remedy to all these emotions? He says, is to be put away from you. And it's a choice. It's a choice with all malice. Desire to injure somebody. Desire to get back. Desire to revenge yourself. Guys, I had to study through this. I had to to read this too. And Paul's using a mirror. On the believer... Again, he's not talking about unbelievers. He's dealing with things that will help us better in our walk. He's, he's got a mirror in front of my face, and he's showing how dirty my face is. And the solution is to wash our face in God's grace by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve him. He's here to help us. He's here to, to guide us, to direct us. The Bible says that no man has seen God and lived. We know that, right? Because if you actually see God, you're in heaven. But may I take that as an application for us? 
that the closer you grow in Christ, the more of you and me is exposed. The more we get into the word, the more we get into worship and prayer, the closer we get to Christ, the more of us is exposed. The closer you and I get in our relationship with Jesus, the more of you and I should die. And that's what Paul is saying. And the thing is, you're the new man. You're the new woman. It has been buried, but we, the residual, the, the pattern, the behavior that, that comes with us once we get saved Paul says, we need to start dealing with that, guys. And you can deal with that. The closer you get in your relationship with Jesus, the more you and I die, and the less and less we grieve God. What blesses the Holy Spirit as we close? Very simply, look at verse 32, and be kind to one another. Can we do that? Tender-hearted. You can't be kind to one another if you're holding jealousies against each other. You can't be kind to one another if there's an anger issue between you. If you're not keeping short lists, if you're keeping long lists, you can't do that. You can't be kind to one another if you have a, a file every time you open it up of the past and throw it at that person's face. By the way, a past that you've forgiven. Have you? Hey, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And, 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 and even as God in Christ forgave you, our motive in this is to be obedient to God and to his word and what we just read this morning. That's the motive, to be obedient. Our manner, how we do this, even as God in Christ, as unto the Lord. We'll get to that. Guys, we're going to get to the marriage chapter. Matter of fact, we're going to get to it real quick, our relationship chapter, chapter 5. And Paul loves to use that word, as unto who? As unto the Lord. How's your relationship with the Lord will reflect how your relationship is to one another. You'll hear more of that. So, so the manner is as, as even as God in Christ. And we should be encouraged by that, what God has done for us. Forgiveness, listen, is the key to every relationship in our life now. And it expresses itself in kindness, tender heartedness, tender heartedness. And it's best medicine for our resentful, hurt, jealous, and pained heart. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you, God, for dealing with us, Lord. Lord, for, for as we read these things, we're just like, wow, conviction. Thank you for the cleansing of your word, Lord how it cleans us, how it brings us to the reality, how it speaks to us, Lord, and our relationally and, and uh, practically, God. I know that's what I've gotten out of this chapter, Lord. You want unity, Lord, love. You want us to be together, although we're different, we're diverse. This is what brings it together, God. We just love one another as you loved us. Forgive one another as you have forgiven us, God. Thank you for that, Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we leave. Give us a blessed week as we leave these doors into our mission field, Lord. Help us to be more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we go ahead and stand.